everyone. Happy to be here with you guys today. And hi to everyone on Zoom. I feel like I never looked directly at the camera, but hello. When I was thinking about what to do for the call to worship and benediction, um, I usually wait until I'm inspired to say something, and then I just write it down. But nothing was coming to mind because I didn't really know how to do a call to worship that would properly address some of the events that happened this past week. Um, specifically the shooting that happened in Georgia or in Georgia on uh, Tuesday. And um, I didn't really feel like I knew how to properly address that because I am not an Asian American and I recognize that I'm at a church that is, uh, you know, where I'm a minority. And I was even talking to Fred about this last night where it just seems so stupid almost to ask people like, so how are you doing, you know? You know, and um, I just didn't really know what to say in response to that. But um, the word tells us that we have a great high priest who has experienced what we experience um, and who hears us when we pray. And so with that, I'll invite you guys to stand and we'll do a call to worship. And if you want to look at the words to the liturgical elements or the song lyrics, it's at bit.ly slash quicksilverchurch. This is from Hebrews. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our prayer today is based on Psalm 5. And a lot of what they talk about in the Psalms is salvation from their enemies. And um, we don't have kings that are trying to conquer our country. We don't have enemies who are... Um, you know, trying to conquer us and put us into submission like Israel did. Um, but there's still enemies, nonetheless. Um, there's still pain inflicted by other people. And so um, this prayer is adapted from Psalm 5. Um, yeah, so you can feel free to uh, say it along with me or just listen along. Um, but the words are on the, on the link. Give ear to our words, O Lord, hear our pain. Give attention to the sound of our cry, our God and our King. We pray to you because we know you love us. O Lord, we believe that you hear our voices. We're gathered here this morning because we believe that you are with us. We know that you do not delight in wickedness and that evil may not dwell with you, that the boastful shall not stand before your eyes, and that you hate all evil. You destroy those who lie against your truth, and you hate those who seek to shed the blood of your children. These truths that we know make it all the more confusing when evil occurs. We feel the pain of your church in Atlanta, and we feel it here at Quicksilver Church as Asian Americans and friends of Asian Americans. We admit that we don't understand why this pain this racism and violence are allowed to take place. But we, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house knowing that we don't have to understand. We will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you and you alone. Lead us, O Lord, in your righteousness because of those who seek to do wrong. Make your way straight before us that we would know how to be your light in times that seem so dark. Amen. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I'd hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. 
But Father, you loved me still And in love before you laid the world's foundation You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost But Father, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone But nothing I did could ever atone But Jesus, you paid my death By your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night But Spirit, you made me see And I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone But Spirit, you moved in me At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone So I'll stand by faith and grace and grace alone I will run the race by grace and grace alone I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone I will reach the end by grace and grace alone How great the chasm How great the chasm That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living home Who could imagine? Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory To wear my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken, the cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope hallelujah hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah, hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name 
Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning, came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, oh Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Father, thank you that we can gather here together. Thank you for this church and the people who come so consistently um, to make it happen, to make this community happen. Pray that you would be with Fred as he preaches and that we would hear you through him. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning. It's great to be with you guys today. It's a, it's a nice day, but it's a little chilly. Um, I did want to... We don't have a spiritual conversation story today, so I wanted to spend a little time... Um, Austin's already kind of started that conversation about how to respond to these sh shootings in Atlanta. Um, and I did want to share some thoughts um, around them. Um, and <laughs> it is difficult to be able to formulate my, formulate, formulate my words. I mean, not just <laughs> physically, but emotionally as well um, in this time. And I know we have been bombarded by messaging um, over social media and through all these news outlets um, around these shootings. And so the first off, I, I'm just, um, I've been grieving um, along with many of you about what's happened. And I think that's happened at a number of levels. And the first thing that I want to, I guess, give permission to or allow space for is that there can be a lot of different responses in this time. And one thing that has concerned me um, about the way social media and news have kind of covered this is that there is an acceptable range of responses. And I want to just open that up to, to be more expansive. There's actually a lot of ways um, that we can experience um, and talk about this. And so, for instance, one of my first responses in the wake of the shootings, like think within 24, 48 hours, was, was this truly racially motivated? And I know um, that feels in some context like an inappropriate question. Um, and yet, I think it's okay to ask that. I think it's, it's acceptable to be able to ask that question um, and as we've seen, um, the, the shooter claimed that there was a sexual addiction and some um, other things that made it seem like it's not, and yet actions often say more, right? So the, act, the fact that six out of the eight victims were Asian American, it does speak to something, <laughs> some type of race involvement, right? And it's not going to be easy to parse that out, but I want to create some space that it's okay to ask that question, whether it is or not. Um, the other thing um, that... The, the other part of the realization in seeing about what's, how things have unraveled or, or unpacked is uh, this man's Christian motivations, right? That he talked about having a sex addiction and that he is, he is a believer. And some of you, some of, some of the people within social media may want to claim that he's not, and yet I see this as one of our own. Like we are heavenly citizens and this man is a heavenly citizen. And so it's important and some of you might say, well, how can you say that as an Asian American? Well, I can hold different views that may seem contradictory um, together. It's possible for us to mourn this um, as one of our own, okay? Because we have a heavenly identity, okay? Um, but this also causes me to reflect and think about, like, what, what, does, what do we as a church teach about sex? And what do we as a church teach about women? 
And I think that's an important reflection. Judy and I were talking last night about a friend of ours who um, just has, exper has experienced some difficult things as an Asian American woman. Um, and Judy actually confessed that she has some trouble relating. Um, and then if, if it's hard for Judy as an Asian American woman to relate some of those things, I'm probably like, and she's so, if that's, that's one extreme over here and Judy's maybe right here, then for me, it's gonna be even more distant. Okay, it's, even to be, it's gonna be even more challenging for me to connect with some of these traumatic experiences, even I as an Asian American, but as a man, um, have experienced in my own life. And so I think this gives some cause for reflection about we as a church, about uh, manhood and what a healthy expression of sexuality looks like and a healthy view of women looks like. Um, and so that's gonna be some of the soul searching that I've been doing. And so I wanna invite you guys, if there are questions that you have, um, I would love to hear them. You can just send me a text or an email or a Slack message saying, hey, I have a question about X or I'd just like to hear more about this topic um, and I will consider it. And I will, I will, I will, that'll be part of my kind of prayer process. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of uh, messaging how it's not okay to be silent. Well, as an Asian American, I think silence can be actually fairly important. Silence doesn't have to indicate that I don't care. Silence can indicate that I am reflecting and thinking and pondering and trying to figure out what the best course of action is, but it doesn't have to indicate that I don't care. In fact, God is often silent. He's not always silent, and yet God is silent. So our, he, God is not afraid to be silent, even in moments of despair and hopelessness. And so I hope we can kind of broaden the range of what's an acceptable response, both from an emotional standpoint and from a processing standpoint in this time. And we also don't have to process this in the way that the world does, okay? because we are heavenly citizens. It's not gonna look the same. We shouldn't expect it to look the same. And some of those views are going to be unpopular at, or, or some of those actions may be unpopular. Um, David French had a great um, kind of, uh, he does this newsletter, he had a great point about this, that the world is great about talking confrontation, but less so about redemption. Okay. As Christians, we can both confront and we have a message of redemption in Jesus Christ. And that message of redemption is always gonna be at odds with the way the world sees things. And so could we be careful that as we, and I know this, it's a lot of discerning required, but could we have a discernment um, in recognizing where the world is in conformity with gospel principles, but also maybe not when it's not as much. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are not afraid of silence. And God, thank you that you allow silence as a means of reflection, as a means of contemplation, meditation, and also as a form of grieving. And so Lord, um, in this uh, season where Asian Americans had faced unprecedented um, racism, as well as attention around uh, issues of race throughout our country, Lord, would we not be afraid to be silent in reflection and meditation and in praying for this country? So Lord, would you allow us spaces to grieve, to be silent, to at times block out all the bombardment of messages. And that just means that could be as simple as turning off your phone and not being on a device. Would we be attentive to your voice and what you want to say to us? Would your spirit give us discernment in a tumultuous period where there are so many messages telling us to do something and not be silent? Would we not be afraid to be silent and listen to you? And at the timing and urging, um, would we know how to speak? Would your spirit speak in and through us? We thank you for your love for us in Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. It's great to see um, Austin and Micah up here this morning. That was great. We have a new speaker set up. I think it's louder. Definitely feels louder. Thank you, Fred, for, for bringing that. Um, we are journeying through Genesis, and I imagine some of you are getting tired of this, um, but I'm still having a good time. So I'm definitely going to evaluate how much further we go through based on my and our collective attention span. Um, but one thing I did want to note is it's really important to me that we make this text relevant to us. So one of the questions that I want to explore today, and again, we are overhearing a conversation that doesn't, that may not at first relate to what our situation today, 
but it does. It does connect. And so one of the ideas that I wanted to um, explore today is this idea of what it means for God to be all loving. Okay. People throw that term around, and I don't actually hear it that much in Christian circles. Um, but in recent discussions with, within Alpha, actually, and some people who are newer to the faith, the term all loving comes out like, hey, if God is all loving, why does he fill in the blank? Okay. And so what I wanted to do is kind of connect that with what this uh, story, what this narrative is doing. And I want to note that it doesn't map exactly, but one of the stories, one of the things that's happening here is the story of God's blessing. And so I kind of want to match up blessing and God's love together. And I know those aren't exactly the same, and we'll talk about where those are not, where those don't come together. But I want you to just imagine there's a connection between the way God blesses and his love. Okay, there's, there is a connection there. Um, because that is the grand theme that's being um, set forth in the book of Genesis in the Pentateuch. And so we're going to examine that. And so you can turn with me. Um, to Genesis 27, and actually what, I'm, what I'd like to do is I like to read it, and so you don't actually have to turn there yet. Okay, you don't have to turn there yet. I'm going to read it, um, and for those of you have, who have not just heard this entire narrative read out loud, um, I want you to close your eyes. Okay, I want you to close your eyes because I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm going to read the entire text. We did this in life group this past week, um, and it was a good experience. And one of, the, one of our life group members, I think it was West, um, he had his eyes closed um, during it, and I thought, you know what? That's actually a really neat way to hear the word of God because that's originally how it was intended to be. It was spoken. People didn't read it. It was spoken. And so I want, um, I want to ask you to close your eyes to kind of focus on the words being spoken. This is Genesis 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt, and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go, bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went in to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near, that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring it near to me, that, my, that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate. And he brought him wine, and he drank. 
Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while, until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I, why, why should I be bereft of, both, of you both in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? We did it. We read it. Mm, okay. So there's a lot of stuff happening in here. All kinds of things happening. And we're going to try to step through it um, as systematically as possible. Okay. The first thing you'll notice is that this is narrative. And when you're reading narrative, it's not exactly historical, but you want to pay attention to some story elements. So there are four characters here. Right? There's four characters. You have Jacob, Esau, Rebecca, and Isaac. Those are your four characters. And then there's a plot. There is tension building. And the plot is all centered around who is going to receive the blessing. And then here's a question that we struggled with in our life group this past week. Who is the hero? Who is the hero? Any ideas? Who's the hero in this story? I'm really asking. Any guesses? I don't know there's a wrong answer here. Well, there probably are some wrong answers. But from the four characters, who's the hero? <laughs> you have four options. Rebecca. I'll go with Rebecca, sure. That's not the first person I was thinking. We can go with Rebecca. Anyone else? 
Is that James? Yeah. Cool. Okay, Jacob has to be a front runner, right? Jacob's got to be a front runner as a hero, as far as people. Um, Esau, probably not, but we'll see, right? We got to look at it. Um, and then it's a question about Jacob. A lot of questions. So a whole bunch of questions going in here. But the thing I would notice is that there's no one likable in this account. There's no one that comes out in a way that's like, wow, they're really admirable, and I really respect what they did. There's no one admirable. There's, so there's no, there's almost like, it almost feels like there's no hero, but there's also no antagonist either. There's no, there's no clear antagonist or protagonist. If anything, and, and this is one thing that came out of our life group, the, the winner is the blessing. The blessing gets carried forward, and that's what's, that's what's exciting about this. That's where the tension is. Um, and so as we look at this, one thing I'd also note is that there is a prophecy there's some important context that we would miss. There is a prophecy about Jacob being younger, but then ruling over the other two brother, ruling over the other brother. And so I want to note that first and foremost, there is a prophecy coming into this and that also um, Esau has sold his birthright. Okay. Esau has sold his birthright as the firstborn. Okay. So when you look at this, if, as we step through it, the first thing you'll notice is Isaac loves good food. And we've known that about Isaac already. That's been made clear in a previous chapter. Isaac is a man of his senses. And so he, um, just like Abraham at the end of his life, has this last kind of hurrah, right? Abraham sends out the servant to find a wife for Isaac. The last hurrah for Isaac is to bless one of his sons. And he chooses Esau because Esau is the firstborn. He's supposed to be the firstborn, received all the privileges, ruled over, had twice the inheritance and ruled over the other brothers. Okay, firstborn had a lot of power in the ancient Near East. And so Isaac chooses the firstborn. And then as this is happening, and there's all these overhearing kind of elements that happen within this text, right? You had Sarah overhearing a conversation in an earlier chapter of Genesis. Here you have Rebecca overhearing, and then she hatches the scheme for Jacob to steal this blessing. And I want you to notice when you look at this scheme— that Rebecca proposes to Jacob. And re remember, Rebecca is the one who's heard the prophecy. We don't know if Jacob has heard the prophecy. I'm sorry. Uh, we don't know if Isaac has heard the prophecy. Rebecca knows the prophecy. Okay. And then it says in 11, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me. So f first thing he notices is like, there's a difference between my brother and I, and I'm like a dolphin. I'm super smooth. My brother's super hairy. So there is a, di there is a difference in how in our skin, <laughs> but the funny thing is Jacob doesn't say anything like, wow, this is really sketchy. We really shouldn't be doing this. There's nothing like that. Jacob's, Jacob's main concern is what if I don't get what I'm looking for? Okay. What if I don't get the blessing? So he's way more afraid of not getting the blessing and getting a curse instead, rather than the consequences of this being a sh deceptive. He's totally lying here, but, the, but Rebecca assures him. And see, so he goes out and does it. And then the other thing you're going to notice as we step through this is then in verse 20, Isaac is suspicious. Okay. Isaac is suspicious about this whole thing happening um, because number one, it happens really quickly. And then he also notices he may be blind, but he's not deaf. And he realizes Jacob's voice. Um, yeah, he, he, he senses Jacob's voice. He says that. But Isaac is so like... He's so attuned to his senses that once he smells the game and he touches uh, Jacob, but Jacob's got the skins on him, he loses, he loses the suspicion. And he even asks Jacob straight up if he's Esau, and Jacob totally lies. And so there is this sense that Isaac doesn't quite get it, that this blindness, this physical blindness that he has, it's not just a, it's not just physical, right? There's a, there's a spiritual, emotional element to the blindness that, that, uh, that Isaac has. And so I think that's really important in this, that Isaac doesn't see well, and that's not just a physical problem. Okay. There's a spiritual, there's kind of a spiritual problem in this. Um, and then when we look at the, the blessing here, there's some things that I would notice. Number one, there's material blessing. Okay, there's the dew of heaven and the fatness of earth. So there's material blessing that's happening. But there's also a blessing about peoples that 
Jacob is going to rule over his brothers and that they're going to be a great peoples. Both of these brothers are going to become peoples, nations. And so now one tension has been resolved. We know who's going to receive the blessing. Jacob is going to receive the blessing. But there's a second tension, and that's the aftermath, right? And just like a soap opera, right as Isaac finishes blessing Jacob, this is in verse 30, Jacob's barely gone out, and now Esau comes back in. And now the tension becomes what's going to happen when this whole scheme has been exposed. And you know this was coming. There's no way this was going to happen without Isaac and Esau finding out. There's just no way that, that that's this, this come up with what's going to happen. The other shoe was going to drop. And then you have the emotional climax. By the way, there's, a, there's a different climaxes here in the text. One of the ways you can identify climax narrative, especially biblical narrative, is when you see a poem. In Genesis 1, the climax of Genesis 1 is the creation of mankind in the image of God, man, male and female. That's the poem. Okay, That tells you one, ask, one way to tell a climax. And here you have two poems. You have the poem of blessing for Jacob, and then you have the poem of blessing for Esau. Both of those are climaxes. And yet there is another climax here of emotion. right? And you get it in verse 34, where, I'm sorry, 33 first, where it says, Isaac trembled very violently. And I think that's so important because the Bible is so often kind of sparse on emotional descriptions that when you encounter something this powerful, you're like, you need to take notice, okay? That Isaac trembles violently. He is angry about what happened. And not only so, but Esau realizes what's happening. And then in 30, 33, 33 and 34, it says he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And often the Bible's understated, but in here it is dramatically, it's saying there was this noise coming from Esau that is incredibly great, that is loud and bitter. Um, and then he asked, bless me, even me also, O my father. And then even toward the end in 38, he lifts up his voice and he weeps. So there's this tremendous emotional focus on Esau's pain. What does that do as, as a reader? I know what it does for me. I hate Jacob, <laughs> okay? When I read this, I am so resentful at Jacob. You know, and part of that is because I'm an older brother, okay? I'm a firstborn son. And um, in my family, uh, I want to be careful to say this because I think my parents are on this call, <laughs> but, I, but they know this. Um, throughout my childhood, I had always had this strong suspicion that my brother was favored. Okay, and one of the examples um, that I've given, or I've talked about this, is, um, you know, Judy was my was my first girlfriend, um, and they didn't ask her many questions. They didn't. They weren't suspicious of her at all. They really welcomed her, really kind of like into our family. Um, but my brother had some girlfriends throughout uh, high school and college, and they always like were a little bit uh, wary of my brother's girlfriends. Like they were very protective of my brother. Like these girls would take advantage of him. But I think they were more concerned that I would take advantage of Judy. And so that kind of favoritism always felt like, man, our, by, the younger brother needs to be protected. Almost like what uh, Rebecca is doing with Jacob here. Um, and not, it wasn't quite scheming, but I always had the sense like they, they liked him more. And so as an older brother reading this, I feel Esau's pain. And I would go even further than that. The fact that it gives us so much detail about Esau's pain tells you that God wants you to feel, that the narrator wants you to feel Esau's pain. And he's actually not interested in you feeling great about Jacob. <laughs> we should not feel great about Jacob. And yet I would argue he has to be considered as one of the heroes of the story because guess what? He gets the blessing. He ends up with the blessing. So why would God make the emotional center this man who loses out on the blessing and loses out on his father's approval because that's something I've always strived for, wanting my dad's approval. And Esau misses it. So why focus on that? And so before I um, examine that even more closely, let me make one comment. Often when we read the Bible, especially if you've grown up going to church, then you see this text, especially stories like this, as a kind of moral fable, okay? When I say moral fable, 
there's a right thing to do and there's a wrong thing to do in the text. And when, after you read it, you've got to figure out what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. It can be not lying, not cheating, not stealing, loving people, reading your Bible. There's always some kind of moral lesson. And certainly there are texts that support that. You know, Leviticus and Deuteronomy have laws that are moral, right? And, and of course, parables have a moral lesson. But could I ask you that when you come to this text, especially when it does not give any kind of clear moral injunction, like moral imperative, could I ask you to try to see this not first as a moral lesson, to put aside your children's Sunday school like moral lens and not ask yourself, maybe put aside the question of, is it okay to lie? Is this justifying lying? I don't think this passage is actually teaching whether or not you're supposed to lie or not. I think there's something bigger going on here because there is a macro theme that has been building throughout Genesis. And that is the theme of covenant and blessing and God's sovereign choice. And so there's a scandal of grace happening here that there is no way anyone can merit the blessing. It doesn't matter what you do. Once God chooses, he chooses. And it can be random or arbit arbitrary, but at least recognize that God is subverting the natural order here. He is choosing the younger brother who clearly should not deserve it because it should be the older brother. He's choosing the younger brother over the older. And then some of you might object, well, wait, you know, what about individuals? Like, how does that relate to individual choice? Well, before we get to individual choice, could we also recognize that the way the text is being is written, Genesis, in, in, in these prophecies, including the prophecy in 25, 23, about these two brothers, it says precisely, it says explicitly, there are two peoples in you. So oftentimes when God talks about choices, he's not just talking at an individual level. He's also talking at a group level. He chooses people, he chooses individuals, but these individuals represent groups of people. So there is a tension and a going back and forth between groups and individuals. And that maybe oftentimes when we read the Bible, we read it through an individualistic lens and God is actually talking about groups. Okay, and that's actually a really important thing to think about as you read a text like Romans 9 through 11, to think about it as groups, not just individuals because we always want to read it as individual choice, but God may be dealing with something bigger. That God has mercy in who he wants to have mercy on, that's a bigger statement than just about individuals. It's about groups of people, nations, ethne. Okay then, what does this mean for individuals? What does this mean about choices then? Okay, our choices still matter. There's something about Jacob's choices here that still make a difference. We don't know that Jacob knew this prophecy, He's behaving as he wants to behave, and his name means to grab, right? His name means, means to grab, and he grabs the blessing. So there's something important here. Just because God chooses, it doesn't negate our choices. In fact, the Bible is written in such a way where our choices, God's choice matters most, and yet our choices also matter. I don't know how they exactly function together. I just know that they do. Okay, I recognize that they do. And so what does this say then about how God loves us? and what it means for God to be all loving? Well, first of all, there are differences in outcomes, okay? God doesn't love everyone, quote, equally, right? When I say equally, not everything turns out the same for people in the Bible. Not everything turns out the same. Esau does get a blessing, okay? He is adjacent to the blessing. He's adjacent to the covenant, but he also gets a blessing. And part of God's mission throughout the course of scripture is to, is to expand the covenant through Jesus Christ to everyone. And yet there will be different rewards in heaven. God is not equal in terms of outcome. And then the question is, does God provide equal opportunity then? Like, does God provide equal invitation? Well, I think I want to be careful how to answer that question, but let's look at, um, let's look forward into Hebrews, right? Where we have a reference to Isaac. In Hebrews 11:20, it says, By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Okay, by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. So there's something about what Isaac did in this, in this chapter that represented faith. Okay, now first of all, I already noted he's spiritually, he's spiritually blind, right? But here's the thing. 
was he spiritually blind after he spoke the blessing to Jacob and he finds out it's Jacob, right? This whole thing is revealed. He still gives the blessing to Esau because both were spoken in faith. Do you notice that? Like he spoke in faith blindly, right? There's no argument, right? He spoke in faith blindly as he's blessing Jacob because he thinks it's Esau. That's still faith. He didn't understand what he was blessing, but it's still faith because he wanted the blessing to pass forward. He wanted to transfer the blessing. Okay, so first of all, that's got to be a form of faith because Hebrew says so. Second, it's also a form of faith for Esau to be blessed because at that point, the blessing has been given and there's something irreversible about it. Like you can't take it back, right? There's a, I think there's a faith element in that. And yet he still wants Esau to have the blessing as well, to have a blessing. It's not as good, certainly. It doesn't have the same material uh, riches, but it does mean throwing off a yoke. So how does this relate to us today? We just want the blessing. It's us. It's for us as believers to want the blessing, to want God's covenant, and then to want to share it with others. And that's how we exercise our faith. It is to want it. Now, does it justify lying and those kind of things? Perhaps because there's something transmoral about this. This is beyond morality. It's it's lying just falls to the wayside in light of the tremendous value of the covenant and the blessing because it is to want it and is to, to respond to God's sovereign choice. And so we just have to sit in that mystery. Okay, we have to sit in that kind of discomfort that the blessing and the covenant is worth even lying for. But the point is you don't go about around lying. The point is the blessing is worth it. That's the point. And it comes through faith. And that's what I would challenge for us today that God loves us through his sovereign choice, that our choices still matter, and that today, as believers, we seek after his covenant. We seek after his promises, and we share them with others. And I don't just mean that evangelistically. We just share it with others, period. Let's pray together. Father God, it is not easy. This is a mysterious and difficult text. Lord, would your spirit illuminate it so that we could understand its message? And Lord, I pray that you have spoken through me in this time, to recognize the significance of the covenant and the blessing. And that this is, not about a, this is not about a moral teaching or it goes beyond a moral teaching. And this is the tremendous value in the faith that comes through transmitting the blessing and the covenant, Lord. And so God, would you help us to be in awe and reverence? You know, Ron prayed this morning that we would be in awe and, um, of the wonder of you. And so God, would we be in awe of the wonder and the mystery of your love? That there are aspects about it that we do understand, but there are aspects that we don't because of your sovereign choice. So help us to see that our choices do matter and that we can chase and pursue those blessings and want them for others. We pray this in your name. Amen. Be thou my vision O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art, Thou my best thought, by day or by night. or sleeping thy presence my life be thou my wisdom and thou my true word I ever with thee and Thou with me, Lord, Thou my great Father, and I Thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, 
now and always thou and thou only put first in my heart high king of heaven my treasure thou art O god be my everything be my delight be jesus my glory my soul satisfied O god be my everything be my delight be jesus my glory my soul satisfied my jesus you satisfy my jesus you satisfy my jesus you satisfy my jesus you satisfy high king of heaven my victory won may i reach heaven's joys oh bright heaven's sun heart of my own heart whatever befall still be my vision O oh, ruler of all heart of my own heart whatever befall still be my vision O oh, ruler of all you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord and it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you lord you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs and we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Great shall 
out your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Cause it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. All right, you may have a seat. Um, and then I wanted to do a little experiment today. So uh, Ron, Grant, and I were talking about some ideas for how we can encourage more question and answer. And so as part of the sharing time, I also wanted to invite um, anyone to ask a question um, about this text or passage and some, you know, something related to what's going on in Genesis, right? Um, because I know, I know for sure um, there have been questions that have come up in your life group discussions that the sermon has not even remotely answered, like completely ignored, right? Um, and so I'd love, I'd love to hear some of that. Well. For today, let's focus just on this chapter, Genesis 27. And I will do my best to try to answer it in a minute. I doubt I will be able to give it adequate attention. So this is almost like a teaser time, and then we can talk later. And Fred Gillum is also here. And if, if you have questions, you can definitely direct them to him as well. Um, because I'll probably pass it off to him at some point for, for, certain, <laughs> for certain topics, okay? Um, so both of us are available for that. Um, yeah, so any questions? And you can just yell from where you are, or on the Zoom, you can just unmute yourself and, and ask. Yeah. So, as I was reading this passage and as I was hearing you talk about it, the question was, if God always plans for Jacob to be the one who carries on the blessing, why not just make him the firstborn? Like, why have to make, make that happen through, like, deceit and lying? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I have a fully formed thought on that. Um, I don't. I don't have a fully formed thought. Thought. Fred, did you want to take a stab? It's re the whole line of Israel is supernatural, and so it's you know Esau being firstborn. Yeah, of course, that's the way we do things. God does something different, and all along He's doing something different. Even Rebecca being uh, barren. So you have that repeated theme of barrenness, which keeps rearing its head, uh, and God overcomes that in one way or another. So uh, this this um, younger shall serve the older is a um, sign that it's God doing it, and it's uh, I think part of the the whole uh, feeling we get from like like Fred was mentioning. You, you can wind up hating uh, Jacob. Esau is the man's man. He's the, he's the quarterback who dates the cheerleader. And, uh, you know, he's, he's the guy everybody wants to be around. And, you know, um, and so the scandal of grace is that that's, that kind, that's not who God chooses. You know, he doesn't choose according to human popularity or human criteria he, do, he only chooses, well, he chooses with different criteria. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Before we start, I'd like to ask everyone to just practice clapping. Uh, this is a song we want to, like, move our bodies to and really be happy to. The song is Happy Day, and this kind of, like, is to really...
really, you know, it's an upbeat song. I want to just practice, like, you know, involving our entire bodies in worship. It's the greatest day. The greatest day in history. Death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out. Jesus is alive. Empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out. Jesus is alive. And he's alive. And oh, happy day. Happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day. Happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I'm changed. Forever I'm changed. When I'm standing, when I'm standing in that place. Free at last, meeting face to face. Jesus, Jesus, you are mine. What's next? grave life eternal you have won the day shout it out jesus is alive and he's alive and oh happy day happy day you washed my sin away oh happy day happy day forever i'm changed oh Happy day, you washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day, forever I'm changed. Forever I'm changed. Oh, what a glorious day. What a glorious way that you have saved me. And oh, what a glorious day. What a glorious way. Jesus. And oh, happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Oh, happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I'm changed. Forever. No clapping during the doxology. Not allowed. I'll bring my banjo next time and we'll clap during the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now I'll leave you guys with this benediction, also from Hebrews, like the uh, call to worship was. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yes. So that's it. If you are on Zoom, we're going to have breakout rooms. And if you're here in person, we'll have socially distanced in-person breakout rooms. And there are cupcakes. So... No cupcakes for Zoom people, but cupcakes here. All right. Thanks, guys.